As Sharon said, I am the CEO and National Director of the ADL, and I've had the privilege of serving in this role for almost four years, and I've been proud to reinvigorate ADL's 100-plus-year-old legacy as the lead organization in the world fighting anti-Semitism and securing justice and fair treatment to all. As many of you know, as an anti-hate organization, we do our work around the world through rigorous research, monitoring and analysis, passionate advocacy, coalition building, and intensive educational programs. In the U.S., we're a leading advocate for issues around civil and human rights, working in the Congress and through the courts to make life better for America's minorities and ensure that the Constitution provides protection for all. We're one of the leading providers in the United States of anti-hate, anti-bias education in schools, reaching millions of children every year in schools across the United States. And we work with law enforcement to track hate crimes and to train them on how to deal with extremism and hate. ADL is the largest trainer of law enforcement in the United States on these issues. And so with this focus here at home, we project to protect minorities abroad as well. We believe it's critical to build a safe and resilient future for communities around the world, particularly those who are marginalized. To that end, our focus on the Middle East, where illiberal ideologies persist, we believe it's critical to find ways to expose that so we can change that to the benefit of those minorities themselves. So one area of bias, injustice, and hate that from day one I've been committed to exposing is combating the illiberal policies of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Of course, it always, hasn't always made us popular, coming out of the Obama administration where we had a very different focus on Iran. The, the policy we chose here at ADL contrasted with the prevailing norms at that time, but I knew that it was the right thing to do. Of course, prior to my coming to ADL, the organization has long been focused on Iran's destructive policies across the region, its financial and material support for terror organizations and activity, its bolstering of extremist regimes and efforts to export revolution, its unceasing threatening posture toward the state of Israel, and its unique role as the single largest state sponsor of anti-Semitism in the world from championing Holocaust denialism contests to fabricating conspiracies of Jewish influence to fomenting hatred against Jews worldwide. But Iran's extreme activities are hardly limited to its own borders. It spread, are hardly limited to what it does outside its country. It certainly does them at home as well. And we are committed to calling out the regime's decades-long malign treatment of its own citizens, particularly religious, ethnic, and gender minorities. Baha'is, Jews, Christians, Sunnis, Baluchis, Kurds, Azeris, Arabs, the LGBTQ, women, and many, many others. And you know, for me, this is personal. My wife, who you will hear from later today, and her family, fled Iran as political refugees in the 80s after the advent of the Islamic Republic and its oppressive totalitarian policies. Through her, I have come to know so many who, due to persecution by the regime, were forced to leave their homes, their birthplaces, where their families had lived for generations. And as a Jew who is the grandson of a Holocaust survivor, this narrative, hi, this narrative of dispossession of persecution and exile is very familiar to me. So the daily reality of harassment and oppression is happening as we sit here, as I speak, to minorities across Iran. But I also realize that too few people know about it, and even fewer people are trying to do something about it. And of course, these same concerns are relevant to the everyday insecurity and mistreatment, not just of minorities in Iran, but across the Middle East. Christians in Iraq and, and Egypt and Syria and Turkey and elsewhere, the Yazidi, Jews, Shia in some countries and Sunni in others, and, and so many more. For ADL, as I said a few minutes ago, our mission is to combat persecution. And whether we're protecting minorities at home or standing up for those who are singled out abroad because of how they pray 
or where they're from, we feel compelled to act. And thus, after intensive consultations with our senior vice president uh, for international affairs, Sharon Nazarian, who you will soon hear from, we decided to launch the ADL Task Force on Middle East Minorities with a very specific mission to educate, advocate, and elevate the issue of challenging these important and all too often overlooked communities across the region, again, including religious, ethnic, gender minorities and those with a different sexual orientation, as well as other groups who face policies of governmental and societal repression and discrimination. Now I'll admit, this effort is just a few months old, even though these are perennial problems. So we certainly have our work cut out for us. But Sharon and I also knew that we couldn't do it alone. And for that reason, we have assembled, we have recruited a task force just a stellar group of individuals who are working on a volunteer basis. And they are scholars, and they are journalists, and they are activists, and they have the expertise in terms of what is happening on the ground, in these minority communities, in these countries, and through their knowledge, through the insights they bring, it gives us the ability to think about how we can leverage the international community and our own capabilities here at home in support of those marginalized groups abroad. And today, we will have the distinct privilege of hearing from many of them and hopefully using this analysis to empower us to take action. Visiting the Holocaust Museum is always a challenging experience, both emotionally and intellectually. The museum serves as a stark reminder of the failure of the international community to protect Jews from the horror of genocide and the millions murdered for their faith and religious identity. But as much as we want to view the museum as a history lesson, something disconnected from the reality today, we cannot. Persecution based on religion or belief continues, and it continues today. Religious persecution is as old as human history, but sadly, it's not history. For, for many faith communities, never again is happening again. Last year, I toured the museum, which I've done many times, but I did it in a new way and saw it in a new light. In the early hours before the beginning of the Ministerial to Advance Religious Freedom last July, I joined a group of survivors of 21st century religious persecution on a museum tour. Walking through those hallways, seeing the pictures, seeing the faces, feeling the weight of the horror, and doing so with survivors of contemporary religious perse persecution brought the experience to an entirely new level. We launched the ministerial at the museum to note this truth, that religious persecution that we hoped was a thing for of the past is still present today. Irene Weiss, a Holocaust survivor whose picture at Auschwitz hangs in the museum, keynoted the opening ceremony in the powerful Hall of Remembrance. Behind her stood survivors of contemporary religious persecution from Burma, China, Iran and Iraq, North Korea, Sudan, Turkey, and Vietnam, representing multiple faith communities of Christians, Muslims, Jews, Yazidis, Baha'is, Amides, and Buddhists. We invited them to the ministerial to keep our discussions grounded in the real impacts of this persecution, that they would serve as a tangible, physical, human reminder of the challenges real people face every day. So I want to thank the Anti-Defamation League, uh, Jonathan and Sharon, uh, for convening this meeting today and for launching this task force so that we can do more together about ways to advance and protect the rights of religious minorities across the Middle East. And what steps can we take collectively to ensure the diverse mosaic of religious and ethnic communities is not lost to history, to see that these people, both men and women, are protected equally under law and play a active role in determining the future of their communities. For the United States, we are fully committed in promoting international religious freedom and protecting the rights of religious minorities, and we're committed in word and deed. The National Security Strategy released in December 2017 recognizes that religious minorities continue to be victims of targeted violence. It states explicitly that the United States will, quote, advocate on behalf of religious freedom and threaten minorities. And we will place a priority on protecting members of these groups 
and will continue working with regional partners to protect minority communities from attacks and to preserve their cultural heritage, end quote. The Vice President has been a real leader in this, and starting in 2017, he promised that the United States would provide direct support to persecuted ethnic and religious minority communities in Iraq. And now the United States is leading the way in rebuilding the environment in northern Iraq so that religious minorities, many of them victims of the genocide ISIS attempted, can return home with hope for a better future. I just returned from my fifth visit to Iraq since taking up this post, and I saw and heard firsthand from communities of Christians, Yazidis, Turkmen Shia, Shabak, and Kakai, and others about the hope that the United States' um, new efforts is bringing. I'm proud that the United States is leading this effort. In Iraq, we're intensely engaged in diplomatic and prog programmatic efforts aimed at improving security and delivering assistance to these traditional minority areas. USAID now has six people in northern Iraq and will soon have eight, an unprecedented number, to help steer this effort. We've now programmed nearly $340 million in this fiscal year alone to support persecuted religious minority communities in Iraq. And this programming is making a tangible impact on the ground, with our Human Rights Bureau also working on training uh, programs to assist minorities with recovery and reintegration. We're also working to revitalize minority areas, including insisting in protecting their cultural heritage. My office helped organize a special training for religious minorities by the Smithsonian Institution. We actually sent them to Erbil to do a cultural heritage training program with religious minority communities. And we recently announced a half a million dollar grant to help stabilize the tomb of the prophet Nahum in al Kosh, overlooking the Nineveh Plains. But we're also working on basic needs. And a great example of this is our work with demining. Our mines adv ad advisory group has deployed uh, 11 people to Sinjar, which leads the international community and the number of people doing this important role. These teams facilitate the restoration of critical infrastructure, access to fertile farmland, which all results in the safe return of Yazidi communities displaced by ISIS. Now, this support to Iraqi minorities is in line with our support for all Iraqis who are recovering from the destruction of ISIS. Uh, our assistance to Iraq's minority communities as for all Iraq's communities liberated from Daesh, includes life-saving humanitarian assistance, restoration of essential services, rehabilitating critical infrastructure, providing psychosocial and legal services, promoting reconciliation, and support for justice. Of course, the road in Iraq will be difficult. While we have hope, the, the future is uncertain. And we are mindful that time is working against us to restore the rich tapestry of religious and ethnic communities. But while I was there three weeks ago, I, I met with ambassadors in Baghdad representing our closest partners to talk about ways we can work together to promote reforms. Our top issue is security for minorities. We want security for their towns and villages. Right now it's not there and it's an immense concern. It's an immense concern. Consequently, we are encouraging and calling on the Iraqi government at the highest levels to quickly work to reassert central government control over minority areas and to remove the militias that are occupying minority towns and villages. And this, we're, we're focused on this because the lack of security slows returns. For Christians returning to the hometowns north and east of Mosul, we think the numbers would have been greater if they had their own uh, police units in place and not external militias roaming the streets. Sinjar remains extremely difficult for Yazidis to return due to ongoing restrictions on the road between Dohuk and Sinjar the presence of PKK sympathetic forces and other militias, and the persistent threat of Turkish incursions. So because of this reality, we're also working to see that minorities can, can integrate locally if and when they choose to do so. Helping minorities stay in Iraq, their home country for a millennia or more, is an important next step while we work on the security situation in their actual towns and villages. But while ISIS is removed, the crisis is not over for minorities if ISIS members are not held accountable. U.S. assistance was key in seeing the first exhumations of mass Yazidi graves in the town of Kocho, and we appreciate the leader of Karim Khan, the head of the U.N. investigative team. And justice for perpetrators uh, means more than being tried for the crime of terrorism against the state of Iraq. It actually means being prosecuted for their individual crimes against minorities, torture, kidnapping, rape, enslavement, and murder and the new legislation introduced by President Barham Saleh to help 
Yazidi women who survived ISIS cap captivity, we think, is a good start, but more can be done. In neighboring Iran, however, the news is less encouraging. Every day, men and women suffer persecution because of their religious beliefs. Members of Iran's Baha'i, Christian, Jewish, Zoroastrian, Sunni, and Sufi Muslim communities are targeted regularly by the regime. They face widespread discrimination, harassment, and unjust imprisonment. Blasphemy, apostasy from Islam, and proselytization of Muslims are actually punishable by death. <clears throat> Regarding our specific concerns about communities, for the Jewish community there, the regime actively promotes anti-Semitism both internally and works to export it abroad. The Iranian regime subjects Baha'is to levels of oppression unmatched anywhere else in the world for that community. As of February, there were reportedly more than 70 Baha'is detained in Iran for the crime of being a Baha'i. And our State Department has repeatedly documented how the Iranian regime routinely employs anti-Baha'i rhetoric, closes Baha'i businesses, and, de and denies Baha'is access to ba basic services. In addition, hundreds of Gandhabadi Sufis have been imprisoned under spurious charges. Uh, and the 92-year-old spiritual leader, Dr. Nurali Ten. Tabande remains under house arrest. Human Rights Watch describes these repressive actions against their community as one of the largest crackdowns against a religious minority in Iran in a decade. And the regime continues to target evangelical and traditional Christians. In November and December of last year, Iranian security services arrested numerous Christians, including 114 in one week alone, uh, raiding their house churches out of a fear that they would sh share their faith during Christmas. And we've seen arrests this year in February with several Christians uh, remained in detention. So we call on Iran to release all these prisoners of conscience and give Iranians the freedom to peacefully practice the faith of their choice or no faith at all. So the path ahead in the Middle East will be difficult. Religious minorities there and around the world are under pressure, if not outright attack. Their horrific bombings targeting Christians during Easter in Sri Lanka demonstrate the links evil people will go to attack the other. We saw the same evil mindset cause carnage in Christchurch with an attack against Muslims worshiping in mosques, and tragically here in the United States with the attacks on Jews worshiping at synagogues in Pittsburgh and most recently San Diego. So to see durable success against hate, to prevent human rights abuses, like-minded governments, Civil society organizations and religious communities must find ways to work together to protect religious minorities and promote religious freedom. This commitment to working with partners is why Secretary Pompeo launched the Ministerial to Advance Religious Freedom last July around the joint goal of finding ways for governments and civil society to work together to protect religious freedom around the world. We hosted representatives from 84 governments at the State Department, including the EU, OSCE, OAS, and UN, and we had over 400 members of civil society and religious groups also participating. And as I mentioned at the beginning, we invited these survivors of persecution to ground our discussions in the cold, hard reality of the repression they faced. And I have to say I was particularly moved by the testimonies we had from the two uh, Iranian converts and the Baha'i member from Iran. The presence of these brave survivors made clear the need for this first ever ministerial. Persecution occurs in too many places around the world. The ongoing repression of and atrocities against Rohingya Muslims in Burma, the brutal Chinese crackdown on Uyghur Muslims, Tibetan Buddhists, and Christians, attacks by terrorists on Christians and other minorities in Iraq and Pakistan, the authoritarian repression of the Baha'is in Iran that I mentioned, but also now in Yemen, and all faiths in North Korea. And we're increasingly concerned about the rising tide of anti-Semitism we're seeing around the world. Studies show that limitations on religious freedom by state and non-state actors are at all-time highs impacting 83% of the global community. To push back against this, at the conclusion of the ministerial, the Secretary wanted to directly address particularly severe violations of religious freedom. So we offered special statements and asked countries to co-sign, focusing on Iran, Burma, and China, highlighting their gross repression and human rights violations. Never before had foreign ministers convened to focus on advancing religious freedom for everyone. Our work is not done, and repression persists. So in this effort, the United States must work with others. We want to work with others, which is why the Secretary announced he'll convene the next ministerial this July 
uh, on, on 16 through 18. So while the challenges are great and seemingly increasing every day, our resolve must also increase. As I said at the beginning, religious persecution is as old as human history. But as you see, for the first time in history, we are building a global effort to stop persecution, to defend minorities, and to promote freedom of religion or belief. We have our own country's commitment based on our founding principles and our uh, commitment to working on this internationally and the unique commitment by this administration. But in addition, more than a dozen countries have created special ambassadors for religious freedom or focal points. Uh, This is unprecedented. We have new funding coming online and new resources. At the ministerial, we launched two new programs, the International Religious Freedom Fund and the Genocide Recovery and Persecution Response Program, both aimed at bringing new resources online to assist persecuted individuals or their advocates. In addition to equip NGOs, our civil society partners, for greater impact, we had special training sessions to help uh, share best practices on uh, receiving government grants. And we challenged, most importantly, we challenged like-minded governments to do more, to do what they can to uphold Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights on Religious Freedom, to take new actions. So while a successful opening effort, there's much more that we need to do. Persecution on account of religion or belief remains a daily reality for millions and millions of people around the world. But the question I, question I want to ask all of us is this. Could we see in our lifetime a moment when religious freedom is enjoyed by people of all faith and none around the world? It's an audacious question, but I think we have to try. Could we actually move religious persecution to the dustbin of history, to where the places like the Holocaust Museum is teaching history? It's a seemingly intractable problem, religious persecution, but we've got to try and we can't grow weary in trying. And why? Skeptics ask why. Why should we waste our time on this? Well, firstly, I think it demonstrates American values and it projects American leadership. It's also very practical. Countries that respect the rights of religious minorities and promote religious freedom have been found to be more stable, prosperous, and less likely to generate violent extremism. But we should also try to see an end to religious persecution, to give hope to the families of people who were killed by ISIS, Yazidis, Christians, Shias, and other. Just last Friday in my office, I met with Nadia Murad, the Nobel Prize winner and Yazidi survivor, a very courageous young woman. She lost a lot of her family, and she'd, she'd give this all back to have them back again. For her and her family, we must try. We must try so that the lives lost in Christchurch, Colombo, and San Diego are not lost to hate, are not lost in vain. I actually visited churches in Colombo last March, and I was so impressed in a meeting I had where Muslims and Christians met together, and both of them faced similar challenges from Buddhist extremists, and both of them were advocating for the other. The Christians said, we have problems, but you really need to help our Muslim brothers. And the Muslims said, no, 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 we have some problems, but you really need to help our Christian brothers and sisters. And that's such a powerful moment. We've got to try for them. And we must try so that believers imprisoned in China and other gulags around the world know that they have advocates and they don't lose hope. I think Vice President Pence said it very well at the ministerial. Quote, as we labor, we can take confidence from the determination of nations gathered here to advance the cause of religious liberty. Our cause is just. We're advancing the first freedom that is essential to people of all our nations and to the world, end quote. So in closing, the challenges confronting members of religious minorities are great. Every faith is a minority somewhere, and every faith is facing threats to their religious freedom. But what we know is that these challenges will not recede if we're silent or inactive. So I want to again salute ADL and Sharon for starting this task force. The United States is committed to to working in common cause with like-minded governments and civil society partners. We are building an alliance around the values of religious diversity and freedom of belief. So let us work together to find ways to redouble our efforts to confront religious persecution, intolerance, including anti-Semitism, as well as find new ways to advance religious freedom for all. Thank you very much.